Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down The Ambassadors Volume 1 by Mark Miller. Right now, Miller has this big event comic going on called Big Game, and because of that I thought it would be good to cover a few more of his various books that are going to be tying into Big Game. Now, I've already covered issue one of that event comic, and the Ambassadors do show up in that book, and they may be important to the overall story, so I thought it would be good to do a little explainer on who the Ambassadors are. So, what is this Ambassadors book about? It is about this woman in South Korea who creates the ability to give normal people superpowers, and she is going to give these powers to six people in the world that she feels are most deserving of this. The little tagline on the first issue of the book is, eight billion people, six can have superpowers, who do you choose? So that's our concept, it is pretty compelling, and this book is quite interesting. So yeah, let's dive into it now, The Ambassadors, Volume 1, by Mark Miller. The Ambassadors Volume 1, written by Mark Miller. The artwork in this book actually has a different artist on each individual issue. So the artists on this book are Frank Quietly, Travis Charest, Oliver Copiel, Matteo Buffagini, Matteo Scalera, and Carl Kershaw. The Ambassadors Issue 1. The art and colors are by Frank Quietly in this issue. In the current day, 2023, in Washington, D.C., some military men are being given a briefing. The military men explain that, during the Cold War, much like the space race, there was also another race to create a Superman with science, and neither the Americans or the Soviet Union were having much luck. So, the U.S. tried faking it. They planned on using actors and special effects and try and create some propaganda videos with a fake actor superhero, and run it on the news in an effort to spook the Soviets. They hired an actor named Mitch Jansen to be their Superman, and they shot some test footage. But the footage never looked convincing, and that project got benched in 1965. In the 1980s, they began a new program called the Bonzo Initiative, named after President Ronald Reagan's old movie co-star from Bedtime for Bonzo. In 1986, we see one of these Bonzo Initiative test subjects. The test subject is a Scottish boy named Jamie McPhail. The experiments messed with his evolution and made him look like a monkey. Scientists were experimenting on him in their lab. One day, Jamie escaped confinement and made his way to Mexico. He used some telekinesis powers he had to break into a vending machine there and drink some soda. When a car almost ran him over, Jamie used his powers to stop the truck in its tracks and lift it up in the air above him. A local man witnessed this and was amazed. Eventually, Jamie's handler, a man named Special Agent Abraham Tomes arrived to take him back to Scotland. Abraham Tomes is a special agent for an organization called the Department of Extra Normal Operations. Abraham offered Jamie some skittles if he put the truck down nice and gently. Jamie complied and then returned with Abraham. Back to the current day now to that military briefing. The military generals explain that the race to find the super genome and the Bonzo Initiative was shut down when Reagan and Gorbachev signed their secret test ban treaty. They then talk about Jamie and say that he died of radiation poisoning at the age of seven. He was the only success the program had. One of the men in the room asks, why is this being brought up now? It is explained this is important to know now because a private individual has succeeded where the world's governments have failed for decades. Someone has created a real-life Superman and they are about to go public with it. One of the generals smiles and asks, well, surely this is excellent news. Can't we just bring him into the fold and co-opt his technology? This guy's doing us a favor, he's bringing America's defense program into the 21st century. 
The military man leading the briefing replies, well, first of all, he is a she, and secondly, she isn't American. Over in South Korea, we will meet the woman who has created the science to give whoever she wants superpowers, and she is unveiling it to the world on television. The woman who made this scientific breakthrough is named Dr. Chun Hee Chung of Chung Solutions. Chun Hee comes out and reveals herself to a crowd of people by flying and levitating down to the stage. She has powers now herself. Chun Hee explains a little bit about how she came to be here. She was a brilliant scientist, the world's smartest woman. Her ex-husband was named Jin Sung Chung, and they were both working on the science to create superheroes together. Chun Hee, she wanted to create superheroes for altruistic reasons, to bring light to the world. Whereas her husband, Jin Sung, he just wanted to create superheroes so he could sell the ability to give powers to the highest bidder. When they seemed to be getting close on their research, Jin Sung backstabbed Chun Hee and framed her for fraud, and she got tossed in prison with an 80-year sentence. And Jin Sung stole all of Chun Hee's research, and he planned on continuing on the work without her. However, without her brilliant mind, his research stalled. And from prison, Chun Hee managed to crack the code, and she now knows how to give regular people superpowers. Chun Hee's original body is still in prison right now. She was not able to escape. She is broadcasting from there, but who is this Chun He that is out there in the world giving this presentation in front of people? Well, she explains that by the time she is done here, she will have downloaded everything into what she calls Chun He 2.0, which is the Chun He giving the presentation, the one that is flying in front of people right now. Chun He also thanks her loyal assistant, Oksana Petrov, for all of her help in rebuilding her fortune from within prison. Chun Hee, she then gloats to her ex-husband, saying, I did it, Jin. I finally cracked it. And as weird as it feels to give up my old body, it's the only way to escape the 80-year sentence your terrible lies condemned me to. The old me was going to rot in jail, but the new Chun Hee is going to put your company in the ground. You don't mess with the world's smartest woman and walk away with your balls intact. The original Chun Hee that is in prison then shoots herself in the head. That original Chun Hee is now fully downloaded into the Chun Hee 2.0, giving the presentation. Elsewhere, we see Chun Hee's ex-husband, Jin Sung. He is currently in the middle of doing some research. He is cutting up into a body, and he sees his ex-wife's speech on TV, and he comments, same old Chun Hee, still a goddamn drama queen. Chun Hee 2.0 is still flying in the air and she announces that she wants to find the most altruistic people around the world and invite them to become ambassadors for their individual countries and she will grant them powers. For now, she is just going to be starting with six people. She says, just think of me as Willy Wonka, but the winners all get superpowers instead of sugary snacks. In the White House, the President is watching this video of Chun Hee's announcement with his military generals. The President asks, So, let me get this straight. She isn't giving this to the military? She isn't trying to make money? You only have to be nice? Terrifying. The president is dumbfounded and scared by this announcement. Over in South Africa, we see a man in a bar. This man is Jamie McPhail, the little kid from the Bonzo Initiative program, the one that looked like a monkey. Well, he no longer looks like a monkey anymore, and he is in fact still alive. He did not die of radiation poisoning, as we've been told earlier, and he has powers from that Bonzo Initiative program. These are powers separate from those created by Chun Hee. 
in that bar. The bartender asks Jamie, So what do you think of this Chun He? You think it's a hoax or should I be volunteering to sign up? Jamie, sipping his beer, responds, Oh, it's for real, all right. This has been coming a long, long time. The superheroes aren't just in comic books anymore, pal. They're living among us, right under our noses. At that moment, five armed men try to sneak up behind Jamie. Jamie uses various telekinesis powers to combat them. He makes them shit themselves. He turns their cocks inside out. He makes their eyes roll to the back of their head and then makes their skulls crush their head. Jamie leaves one of the armed men behind. The surviving armed man asks, Why did you let me live? Jamie answers, Somebody needs to pay my bar bill. Jamie, he then leaves the bar. The Ambassadors Issue 2. The artwork in this issue is by Carl Kershaw and colors by Michelle Acera Sikorn. Seven years ago in India, we meet a man named Benu Bahadi. He will eventually go on to be the ambassador representative from India. This issue is his origin story. So, seven years ago in Delhi, in India, Binu Bahadi is working at a cell phone store in the mall with his best friend, Jai. Binu has a crush on a girl that works in that mall named Jita Ganesh. He struggles to work up the courage to talk to her. One day, terrorists start shooting innocents in the mall, and they take Jita hostage. Binu, despite having no powers, he heroically offers to trade his life for Jita's. He puts his hands up, he walks over to the terrorists, and he tells them, Please, let Jita go, take me instead. She's a good person, from a good family. She's got a future. I'm just a guy working in a phone store. The terrorist asks him, Seriously, you want to trade places with this girl? Banu says he does. The terrorist, he's going to make the trade. And as they're doing it, a SWAT team bursts into the mall and they start shooting at the terrorist. And the terrorist that had Jita gets shot and killed in the process. But Binu gets caught in the crossfire. He gets shot several times and he falls into a coma. He is in that coma then for seven years, which then takes us up to the current day now. We jump over to Chun He. She is in her secret base, which is in Antarctica at the South Pole. She is talking to her loyal assistant, Oksana Petrov. Oksana says that so far they have gotten 200 million applicants for the ambassador program, and it's only been four days. They discuss some of the applicants from various countries. They are all very good, altruistic people, but none of them seem right. They don't seem like team players. It's really hard to find good candidates, as it's such a huge decision selecting the right people. The first person that Chun He wants to bring into the ambassador program, though, is Binu Bahadi from India. She heard his story. He has been in a coma for seven years. He survived the massacre in Delhi. Binu isn't anything exceptional, but he did the right, heroic thing, and sometimes that is enough. Chun He, she has her people currently operating on him bringing Banu out of his coma. One week later, Banu is up and about again, walking around in the Antarctic base there. Chun He explains to him, You've been selected to join the Ambassadors Banu, an international rescue squad that represents the best our countries have to offer. I'm turning six human beings into superheroes here, and you've been chosen as an ambassador for India. Banu asks, why him? Oksana answers, because Jita told us what you did for her, and that was a pretty amazing thing, and Chun He's looking for people she can trust. Chun He then explains how the powers work. Binu will wear this special wristband, and through the band he can download three powers at a time from a power bank, 
and swap the powers in and out. Binu, he doesn't know what power he should take to test out. Chun he explains some of the powers. There's gravity control, flight, and speed. For now, she suggests gravity control. It will allow Binu to make things lighter or heavier. She tells him to test out the power and try to use it to lift some of the weights they have on the workout rack here. Binu, he tries concentrating and using the powers. At first, he messes up, causing people to float up into the air and then dropping them to the ground and then breaking the ground. But eventually, he gets the hang of it. Later on, he is given a costume with a flag of India on it, and he is told that his superhero name will be Codename India. Binu, wearing the costume, thinks it is maybe a little bit too obvious, too on the nose. I mean, a flag? Maybe they could have gone with a national animal instead? Chun He explains, trust me, we've explored all of these ideas, and if we base our costumes on animal motifs, we'll all look like the cast of cats. And besides, tigers and panthers are all very cool, but the Australian ambassador will be a kangaroo. Oksana, she adds, We've had comic book artists designing these costumes for months, and this was literally the only theme the entire crew agreed upon. Binu, he accepts his costume and his name. He then helps Chun He by using his powers to fly a satellite up to space for her. Chun He explains, in addition, to the three powers he can swap in and out, every ambassador is protected by an electromagnetic aura. It will make them bulletproof and it will also give them air to breathe when they are flying up high in the sky. So Binu, testing his powers with Chun He, flies that satellite up to space. Afterwards, Binu flies down and he is really starting to enjoy and embrace his new powers. A few days later, we see a potential ambassador recruit from Mexico arrive through a teleportation doorway into the Antarctic base. His name is Chico Blanco. He is surprised that they chose him, but he is assured that Chun He wanted him and she does not make mistakes. So that is the extent pretty much of the origin for the Mexican ambassador. But back to Binu. It has now been a few days. Binu is talking with Chun He and Oksana. He sees some of the reporting on the news about his heroics as codename India. Chun He and Oksana tell Binu that he can tell his friends and family that he is no longer in a coma and is uh, alive again, but he has to keep wearing the mask and keep his identity as codename India a secret, as people will hound him wherever he goes otherwise. He shouldn't even tell his parents. Binu asks, what about the girl he likes? The one that he almost died saving? Jita Ganesh? They explain to Binu that he should not tell her either. They also break the news to him that since he has been in a coma for seven years, Jita actually started a relationship with Binu's best friend Jai, and they are married and have a little boy now. Binu is sad to hear this. He wants to go home now and tell everyone he is alive. Chun He tells him, remember, they can't know about any of this. When you go home, they need to think you just woke up from a coma. Binu, he promises not to tell them. Binu, he goes home, and he has a reunion with his family. Jita and Jai are there with their little boy, too. Jai is a little awkward because he is now married to the girl that Binu had a crush on. But Binu tells him that he is his best friend, and they're always going to be good. Jita, she then thanks Banu for saving her all those years ago, and she tells him, forget about Codename India and all of these other ambassadors we're hearing about. You're the superhero as far as I'm concerned. Jita has no idea that Banu is Codename India. Banu, he even gets offered his job at the phone store back. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> He's going to be fast-tracked to assistant manager. Banu will still have to have a secret identity, so... This job will play the part for now. Binu, living in his secret identity, does go back to the phone store and eventually to work. On his first day there, he is visited by three people wearing fancy suits. A woman named Vera Benet is one of these people. She works for Chun He's ex-husband, the evil Jin Sang. She offers Binu a check 
for a hundred million dollars if he tells them the secrets of the powers that he has been given. The Ambassador is issue three. The artwork in this one is by Travis Sheray and colors by Dave Stewart. In this issue, we will be introduced to a woman named Yasmin Gauvin, who will become codenamed France, and her son, Jean-Luc Gauvin, who will also get powers and be her sidekick, and he will have the codename Paris. So Yasmin and her son live in Paris. Yasmin's ex-husband is not in the picture. He is a pompous French filmmaker too busy for them. Yasmin, she works at a hotel as a receptionist. She worries, though, that her son, Jean-Luc, doesn't respect her or others, and he admires his asshole father. She also seems to worry that her son is a psychopath. Yasmin, she wrote into Chun He Chung, asking if she could be an ambassador. If she were a superhero, maybe her son would respect her, like he seems to respect his dad. Maybe it would keep him on a good path. Yasmin, she writes Chun He and says, I'm worried my son is going to hurt someone. Jean-Luc has always been a loner, but ever since my husband left, he's descended into something I can't understand. It doesn't help that his father is a revolutionary filmmaker here in France and is being courted by Hollywood. My son was named after my husband's idol, Jean-Luc Godard, but I'm afraid he never lived up to our high hopes. He doesn't get picked on by jocks at school. He gets beaten up by the Warhammer kids. He keeps an enemies list that runs to the hundreds. And I found a plan to murder his classmates with the guns he's been sourcing on the dark web. When I confronted him, he denied everything. Now, this is Jean-Luc's denial to his mom about his hit list on his classmates. Jean-Luc tells his mom, Jesus, mama, I was just having fun. Yeah, these guys piss me off, but I'm not a psycho. I just design these little assault plans to get me through the day. Yasmin continues in her letter to Chun He. I'm worried Jean-Luc has no respect for other human beings. I'm worried he has no respect for me. But if I were a superhero, if you let me be part of this team you're building, he might respect me like he respects his dad. I have no money, no status, and nothing to talk to him about. Make me one of your ambassadors and I could finally be a role model for him. You know what it's like to have a difficult ex-husband. Yo. This girl's kid is a school shooter. <laughs> Do not give her powers. But somehow, Chun He resonates with this message of having a difficult ex-husband. And she eventually did make the offer of powers to Yasmin. And she accepted. Yasmin will be codename France. After an unspecified amount of time, perhaps a few weeks of Yasmin using her powers, she finally reveals to her son that she was selected to be the hero of France. Yasmin is in her Paris apartment with her son, and she asks her son to turn the hands on a clock to midnight, and he does so, and it reveals a newly built passage for them in their home. There are two poles which they then can slide down, much like Batman and Robin did in the old Adam West TV show. They slide down the poles, and it takes them to a secret underground base, which will serve as their headquarters here. Jean-Luc is impressed. Yasmin shows a smart band she is wearing, and how it lets her download any three superpowers she needs from chun -He's base at the South Pole in Antarctica. There is over 50 powers for them to choose from. She has been using these powers as well as a detective app to solve crimes. Jean-Luc, a little bit dumbstruck, comments, This is crazy. I don't even know what to say. Yasmin tells him, Don't worry. I got you one too. Jean-Luc gets his own band and powers, and he will be known as Codename Paris. They go deeper into their secret HQ, and they get inside a red sports car, and they take it out for a night of crime fighting. Yasmin downloads a stunt driver power for herself and she drives the car fast through the Paris streets. They are trying to capture some jewel thieves that Jasmine has been tracking for a while. She tracks them down to an abandoned building. She then downloads some arachnid mode power for herself, 
and some sort of flea agility power for her son. And after some jumping and climbing, they reach the top of this abandoned building. They are then above the thieves. Yasmin borrows the power of being a prize fighter. She then tells her son to download some karate abilities for himself. They do. They then both jump down and beat up the thieves. One of the thieves shoots at John Luke, but the bullets don't hit him. They are blocked by the smart band's electromagnetic aura, making them bulletproof. After Yasmin and Jean-Luc beat up the thieves and tie them up in some rope, they phone the police. And then they return to driving. As they are driving, Yasmin learns of a fire, and she switches the red sports car into fly mode. And her and her son fly above the streets of Paris to where the fire is. Once at the building that is on fire, with the car hovering in the air above it, she tells her son to borrow the telekinesis powers and pick some people up that are stuck in the fire and levitate them to safety while she takes the flight and fireproof powers to save anyone that is trapped inside. Yasmin, she then bursts through the burning building and saves all of the remaining people caught in the fire. Later on, she returns to her son. Her son asks, I didn't know that we could fly. Yasmin explains, well, you can't. Not until you're 18. This and the plasma beams come with an age restriction. You still need something to look forward to. They then learn of a runaway train. They fly their car in front of the train and Yasmin instructs her son, you need to match the speed of the train and then hit the brakes as hard as you can. Gravity and telekinesis would have been better, but another ambassador is using them right now for a rescue mission in Pakistan. Brute strength will have to do. Yasmin, she borrows the power of strength and manages to stand in front of the train, slowly pushing against it and stopping it over time, grinding the train to a halt. Once the train is stopped and the people are saved, Yasmin hugs her son and tells him she is so proud of him. Above the train, Jamie McPhail is watching them. A man drinking beside Jamie asks him, Well, Monsieur Jamie, looks like... You're not the only super person in the world anymore. What do you think of all your new friends out there? Jamie answers, I see dead people. At an embassy in South Korea, Chun Hee is with her assistant, Oksana, and Chun Hee is writing an email to Yasmin. She writes, Dear Yasmin, can I just say how pleased I am that you and your son have been doing such a great job. I'm also delighted that your relationship has improved, and you've brought some much-needed light to the world in these very strange times. But I also thought now would be the time to let you know that it wasn't your email that prompted me to pick you as our ambassador for France. It was Jean-Luc's email three days earlier. He told us you were the best mother in the world about the sacrifices you made for him every day, and how you never once badmouthed his father even when you had good reason. He said you were lonely and you needed a little fun, so he asked us to make you a superhero. He loves you so much, he's just at an age he has a hard time showing it. And if you ever thought he was going to hurt someone, well, you couldn't be more wrong. I look forward to seeing you both at our big official launch. Warmest regards, codename Korea. Later on, we see Yasmin working her day job still at the hotel. She gets visited by that Vera Benet woman, the same woman that approached Codename India last issue. Vera tells Yasmin, My name is Vera Benet, and I want to make you an offer on behalf of Jin Sung Chung. In the final page of this issue, Yasmin's son, Jean-Luc Gauvin, is walking by a pier, and he throws a handgun into the water. The very handgun I assume he was going to be a school shooter with, but now that he has superpowers, he feels like he doesn't need to do that anymore? I don't know, that's kind of a weird plot point. Anyway, after Jean-Luc throws the gun into the pier, he walks off happily, ready to be codename Paris. The Ambassador is issue 4. The artwork in this one is by Oliver Coipel, and the color is by Giovanni Nero. In Brazil, drug dealers used to rule the streets, and they would charge citizens for things like gas and electricity. But then, the drug dealers got replaced 
by the corrupt police led by Captain Eduardo Lobo, who used his militia to move in on the criminals' territory. Only he was just as bad as the criminals, and now it's the police that charge the people for gas and electricity, and the cycle of crime and corruption and extortion continues. A drug dealer in Brazil named Octavio is causing a problem. Captain Eduardo Lobo sends one of his best enforcers working for the militia, a woman named Z. She is to take his group down and send a message for him to get in line. Z storms Octavio's complex, killing his henchmen. And then, when she finds Octavio, she tells him, Your henchmen are dead. I've been sent to deliver a message from our mutual friend, Captain Lobo. You're going to be his butler now, and your wife and daughters are going to be his housemaids. All your drivers are working for him as of tonight, and everything you own is his. Do you understand? Octavio, he understands. And the next day, we see Octavio is the new butler for Captain Eduardo Lobo, and Eduardo is giving Z money for a job well done. Elsewhere in Brazil, a priest named Father Vitor Pieria is reading a message on his phone. He has been chosen to be an ambassador for Chun He's new group. But he seems unsure if he really wants to accept this honor. Later on, Father Vitor Pieria is visited by Z, the militia enforcer. Z is here for confession. Vitor knows all about Z and her history and the work she does for the militia killing their enemies and spreading their corruption. He criticizes her for it. Z argues, What am I supposed to do? If I walk away, I end up dead and he replaces me with someone worse. Z then warns Vitor, The strike that you're organizing is a really bad idea, by the way. You've been protected here because of your status, but you interfere with their tax collecting? They'll put a bullet in your head. Later on, Vitor gets teleported to Antarctica to talk with Chun He and hear about her offer with the ambassadors. Vitor says he's not interested, and he didn't even nominate himself for this. Chun He replies, well, 2,000 of your parishioners did, and that's when we realized we were looking at someone special. Rio's got a lot of problems. All those cops that joined the militias might have cleared out the drug lords, but they've created something worse, and your politicians just turn a blind eye. You've brought a lot of hope since you came to that parish, but you're only human. What if we turn you into something else? Vitor asks, by putting on this wristband, letting your computer take over my body? He refuses. He says that he's doing fine as he is. Days later, back at his church, Captain Lobo, frustrated by Vitor's apparent refusal to stop his organizing activities, is forced to send Z to kill him. When Z arrives, Vitor is praying. She points a gun to his head. She doesn't want to kill him, but she is being ordered to. She tells him not to turn around. She doesn't want to have to look at him when she pulls the trigger. Vitor replies to Z, It's funny. Last night I was standing at the South Pole, and a woman I'd never met gave me this magic wristband. She said it would give me superpowers, and she wanted me to join a team she was building. Have you ever heard anything more ridiculous? She told me to think about it for 24 hours, but I told her I was already on a team. You're not going to hurt anyone, Z. Vitor then slaps the wristband onto Z's wrist. Next thing we see, Z now has the powers of Chun He's ambassadors, and she is utilizing those new powers to run the corrupt Captain Eduardo Lobo out of town. She destroys his mansion and forces him to leave. In the aftermath, Vitor gets to continue his work in the church supporting the people. The townspeople are happy because the corrupt Captain Lobo is gone. And Z, she teleports over to Korea now to meet the other ambassadors. Elsewhere, Jin Sung Chung, the husband of Chun He, is in San Francisco. He has cracked the code as well in how to give normal people superpowers. 
he is having some billionaires come meet him. They are going to give him tons of money, and in exchange, he is going to give them powers. So far, he has 41 billionaires in this room on board with this program. One of the prospective billionaires asks, Will the upgrade cure my diabetes? Because I've been on an insulin pump since I was 8 years old and in and out of the hospital half my life. Jin Sung answers, The upgrade comes with perfect health, so you'll never be in the hospital again. But we do here must never go public. Do you understand? This club only works if people never know. The billionaire replies, Oh, of course. Just this thing with your ex and all these other super people she's been making out there, the uh, rescue squad she's putting together, they won't be a problem, will they? Jin Sung smashes the table in the room in a rage. And then he calms down and says coolly, No, Chun He won't be a problem. The Ambassadors Issue 5. The artist on this one is Matteo Buffagini and colors by Michelle Acera Sacorn. In this issue, we will meet Bob Taylor, the ambassador from Australia. Chun He and Oksana are interviewing Bob, seeing if he is right for the role. Bob Taylor is a 72 year old man. He is wheelchair bound, and he would like to upgrade his body and volunteer for the ambassadors and be able to move around again. Chun He and Oksana are a little concerned because Bob used to be Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and when he was a political figure, he made a litany of racist and homophobic attacks during his career. Bob says he was just playing to the crowd. He became a totally different guy when his wife passed. He thinks that they might think different of him when he tells them his little secret. The truth is, he's gay. Bob colorfully elaborates, saying, I'm bent as a two-bob note, mate. I cheated on my wife our entire marriage, and all my big talk was just a cover story. Bob, he is asking for a second chance. Chun He thinks on it, and she kind of likes the idea of someone changing their ways. But she makes one condition. She says, This is one occasion where your identity must be public. People need to hear about your change of heart. Bob Taylor, wheelchair bound, says it's a deal. So with that, Bob is the new ambassador from Australia. And now we see glimpses of Bob in action, rescuing some mountaineers stuck in Siberia. They have been stuck here freezing for three days. Bob is running and climbing over to them. When he finds them, he forms an igloo around them to try to get them warm. He radios into Chun He and Oksana to teleport all of them out of here, but then he loses signal when a storm comes overhead. And then a Malaysian jet carrying hundreds of passengers crashes right down on top of him, plunging Bob and the mountaineers into the freezing water below through the ice that they are on. Bob tries to save everyone, save the mountaineers, save the people in the plane, but he is not powerful enough. That is when Jamie McPhail arrives, and Jamie uses his many powers, his telekinesis, to lift everyone, including the plane, out of the water, and he places them all safely on the ground. And then Jamie makes everyone promise to keep him a secret, and let Bob here take all the credit. Bob asks why. Jamie answers, Do you think you're the only super people on the planet? There's bastards out there doing terrible things and they'd rip me apart if they ever tracked me down. These are the richest men in the world, my friend, and they'll be coming after you and your friends very soon. Bob asks who he is. Jamie answers, I'm Jamie McPhail. Let's just say I'm an early draft of you. They took me from an orphanage and messed around with my evolution to the point where they didn't even have a name for it yet. I was meant to be put to sleep over 30 years ago, but... The doctor in charge just released me into the wild, and I've been living on the streets ever since. They promised me I would be a superhero, but my dreams went up in smoke. I still get to help people out here and there, though, from the shadows, but I can't stay in one place too long. I just have to go before they catch up with me. The weather then clears, and Jamie disappears, and Oksana begins teleporting everyone there to safety. Elsewhere in the Australian Outback. 
Jin Sung is with his billionaire pals that he gave powers to. And they are messing around, doing some evil shit, killing people for fun. Jin forces the billionaires to kill innocent people as some sort of bonding exercise. And also so all of the billionaires will have some dirt on each other, which will avoid anyone spilling any secrets. After Jin forces one of the new billionaire recruits to kill an innocent with his powers, the topic of conversation then turns to Chun He and her ambassador's group once again. Jin Sung says he is not worried though. He says that they will all be dead soon enough. He has a little traitor in their ranks. Who is that traitor that turned? We will find out next issue. The Ambassadors issue 6. The artwork in this one is by Matteo Scalera and colors by Lee Luridge. In the current day, Chun He is talking to her assistant Oksana about her life story. When Chun He was six years old, she won the science prize at her school for gifted children, winning against all the bigger kids. It was one of her greatest accomplishments. Jin Sung, who was also at that school was angry he lost. He was so angry he didn't speak to Chun He for the entire term. Eventually, though, he apologized for not speaking to her. Chun He didn't realize, though, that this was just a calculated move, a way to keep her close and piggyback on any breakthroughs she made. Jin Sung formed a relationship with her, and at 17 years old, he proposed to her and they got married at 18. Eventually though, he framed her for fraud and took off with the old rich lady that was funding their research. He then killed that rich lady by making it look like she committed suicide by jumping off a tall building. Chun He, after finishing that history lesson, is still talking to Oksana and she gets interrupted by a tsunami warning happening here in Korea. Chun He and her team immediately jump into action. They all meet up in Korea to tackle this situation. The members of the ambassadors that we've seen being built over these last few issues that are coming together to fight this tsunami are Chun He Chung, codename Korea, Binu Bahati of India, Chico Blanco of Mexico, Z of Brazil, Bob Taylor of Australia, Yasmin Govan of France, and Jean-Luc Govan, her sidekick, as codename Paris. So all the ambassadors start working together. They're trying to evacuate the area that the tsunami will hit. They are using powers like teleportation and growing large in size, etc. Eventually, they successfully break up the wave, minimizing the damage. The tsunami wave, though, was just a distraction, a way to get the entire ambassador group together. In Antarctica, an oil rig is dropped on the secret base that is housing their powers. And that is when Jin Sung and his powered up billionaires arrive and reveal themselves to Chun He and her ambassador team. Jin Sung tells his ex-wife, Hello wife, are you ready to be screwed over again? Because I'm really excited about it. I'm afraid my research didn't go as badly as I pretended. I just shared the benefits with a very select group. You wanted to build an international rescue service. I wanted billions from every rich guy I upgraded. We're kind of the world's most exclusive club, and we're not really keen on competition. You don't stay elite if anyone can join. The ambassadors try and access new powers, things that would be better suited for this superhero battle about to happen. But because Jin Sung's crew already attacked the base at the South Pole, all the ambassadors are stuck with the abilities they already downloaded, and they can't swap them out right now. Chun He asks, How did you know where to find the power bank? It's hidden under a hologram. Jin Sung then reveals that he tried to buy off each of the ambassadors, but they all rejected him. However, Oksana, Chun He's assistant, did not. She is the traitor. Oksana, who is there, explains herself. She says to Chun He, Don't get all sanctimonious with me, you witch. 
I thought you were going to give me powers when we started this, but you gave them to people you've never even met. Jin Sung, he promised to make me faster than a racing car. Can you believe that? Heat vision? Super breath? I'll even be able to shrink. Chun He tells her assistant, He's not going to give you anything, you idiot. He's using you like he uses everyone. Jin Sung jumps in and says, Hey, that's not fair. I'm more than happy to help her shrink. Jin Sung turns to one of his billionaires and says, Would you make Miss Petrov here really, really small, like the size of a comma? And one of the billionaires with his powers complies reluctantly and kills her by shrinking her. Chun He attempts to attack, but Jin Sung uses one of his powers to freeze her in place. And then he gloats to the others. And the battle begins. The billionaires seem to get the upper hand, though. They are bashing away at the ambassadors. The ambassadors' electromagnetic auras are protecting them, however. Jin Sung tells his man to just keep hitting them. Everything breaks eventually. This is when Jamie McPhail arrives again. He starts shooting many of the billionaires in the head just by pointing his finger at them. Jin Sung asks who the hell he is. Jamie says, Jamie McPhail, Scottish guy. Now get the hell away from that lassie. Jin Sung snarkily shouts back, Hey, nobody gets to blindside me twice. This isn't a Marvel movie. You don't get to win just because you're nice. There's eight of you and 40 of us. That means we're going to crucify you. Jin Sung then starts to feel Yasmin, aka Codename France, poking around in his head trying to use one of her duplication powers she currently has that lets her borrow an ability. Jin tells her, Hey, don't try duplicating my powers, Miss Hotel Receptionist. I can feel you probing around in there, but you can only copy one at a time. And I'm the smartest man alive, and I don't take chances. I never start a fight unless I know I'm going to win. Yasmin, she does borrow one of the powers Jin was using the ability to give people aneurysms, and she starts using them to kill all the billionaires that are allied with Jin Sung. Jin asks her, what is she doing? And she explains, I've duplicated the power you kept on standby for any clients who got a little shitty with you. I've given them all aneurysms, Mr. Chung. Close them down with your own personal insurance, and that means you're on your own. Jin Sung, he still stands defiant. He gloats. You think I give a shit? All the little rich boys were just to help me fund my work. I've spent years building this indestructible body. Nothing can stop me now. He then turns to his wife and tells her, Oh, Chun He, wasn't prison bad enough? I do the hurting, you do the crying. That's the way it's always worked, and I'm only going to make you look like a fool again. I think you forget who's the boss in this relationship. Chun He then uses her power, and she walks over to her ex and punches him so hard his bones explode out of his body. All it took was that one intense punch. Chun He then tells her now dead ex husband, I think you forget who won the science prize. She then tells the others, I didn't even mean to do that. When he said his body was indestructible, I thought he actually meant it. I only wanted to knock him out. Well, with that, Chun He and her ambassadors have won the day, and Jin Sung is out of the picture. In the aftermath, a launch party for the ambassadors is held. More members are added to the group. Jamie McPhail joins as codename Great Britain. He will be secretly using his own powers, though. Jamie kind of resents that he is codenamed Great Britain as he is a Scottish nationalist and believes Scotland should be independent. Bob Taylor of Australia tells him, Look, we're all dressed like wankers, mate. Just think about all the Sheilas you're going to be pumping and get over yourself. Also at the launch party, a new ambassador member from Italy is being interviewed. He is apparently a model, influencer, and YouTuber who saved a truck driver when he was hanging off the edge of a cliff. Another new member is Shona Runga from New Zealand. She is their first wheelchair user on the team. She was picked because of the climate protests she organized, and Chun He wants her to head up their eco initiative. Chico Blanco from Mexico introduces himself to Shona, 
and he comments how he still has no idea why he was chosen. While at the launch party, Bob Taylor, the ambassador of Australia, talks secretly with his son, Dave. Bob and his son, Dave, used to be pretty homophobic, the both of them. Dave, though, admits to his dad, look, I might not agree with how you live your life now, but you're still my dad, and it's bloody brave if this is really who you are. I want you to know how much we love you and how proud we are of what you've been doing out there. Bob whispers to his son, I'm not actually gay, mate. It's a frickin' scam. I was 72 and could barely walk. Now I feel great, and I even have superpowers. I just told these lefty assholes what they wanted to hear. Bob's son is shocked. A woman talking to Chun He says that she is delighted to hear the ambassador's team is expanding to Pakistan, Japan, and other countries too. Chun He responds, Speaking of which, I've been talking to our diversity department and I'm a little worried about representation on the team as it stands right now. Do you think we need a token American? And with this, we end the Ambassadors Volume 1. Okay, so that was the Ambassadors Volume 1, and I thought this book was quite fun. I thought it was interesting having the different artists on the different issues so we could compare and contrast their various styles. Normally, I like more consistency in the artwork, but that experiment was an amusing one and I think maybe did pay off, especially because each issue kind of focused on a different character, so it kind of worked having the different artists. I thought the overall concept was pretty fun. Anytime you give normal Joe's superpowers, it is usually amusing. The overall threat was also kind of interesting with this Jin Sung and Chun He and their uh, squabbling and battling here. Uh, there was some good action in this book, and overall it was a uh, very good time. It wasn't anything groundbreaking, but it was solid fun. Now, my one criticism is that I feel like the story wrapped up pretty quickly in the final issue, and... Uh, the big climactic battle kind of just ends with Chun He punching her ex-husband really hard and uh, killing him that way. And it didn't really seem like that would be enough to take him down, but apparently it was. <laughs> but uh, still, there's going to be a volume two here and the story is going to uh, go on. And as a debut volume, there was a lot of uh, fun to be had here. So I'm going to give this one a seven and a half out of ten. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back in the future with another comic.